All right, everybody, welcome to episode six of the Hound's Tales podcast. Uh, I'm James Hudson here with, as normal, Dylan Watson and Daniel Evans. And today we have our special guest, Dennis Scott. Good evening, everybody. Dennis Scott's a good friend of ours. He's really helped us a lot out and in getting into this pen world and really hooked us up with some some good quality stuff and uh, kind of aided us along in some things that we don't know. So, um, first off, I, I kind of ask you, Dennis, I'll, you know, introduce yourself a little bit. How long have you been doing this kind of stuff? Well, it's been in and out in the field trial world for years. You know, uh, I started out with my father as a young child, really young child. And actually James's grandfather, you know, we'd, we'd field trialed back in the day, you know, uh, through the years and, and he was a fine fox hunter as, as, as any I've ever known, but uh, I'm getting ready to turn 50 this, this year. And I don't know of uh, many days that I've breathed air that I didn't have a fox hound. So <laughs> pretty much 49 years. That's right. <laughs> Once you're in it, it's hard, especially from birth, it's hard it's, to get out of it's it. It's a disease that you can't cure. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said you've been pen hunting for a good little while now, you know, what's, uh, what's some of your success stories? Uh, I know you're, you've got a pretty good name around the pen world. So, well, I mean, I started out on the outside with the James River when I was a young child. My father you, what, has been the president of the James River, and uh, we ran in the James River many times when it was held right up here in Sherwell. And uh, to me, that was just, I mean, it was a, a part of the a, a time of year that I look forward to just as much as Christmas. Right, right. Uh, and as, you know, the, the communities built up, the houses built up, the outside world wasn't as acceptable to fox hunting as what it had been in the past. Uh, it had to go to pens. And to me, growing up in that outside world of seeing the foxhounds just, you know, go on a 10-mile stretch and the fastest, most toughest dog would win to go into a pen to where that, that game had to make that turn, you know, 800 acres across, he, he, he had to make that turn and come back. So it it changed. I'm not saying it's better. I'm not saying it's worse, but it took me a little while to accept it. Right. Right. I guess about 10 years ago, I started saying, well, Hey, you know, this is what we have now. This is, this is great. You know, it's not going to be what we had in the past, but it's going to be what we're capable of having now. And I want to be part of it again. And Lord knows I've enjoyed it, but I guess about 10 years ago, we, I put the first hound back in a competition again. Right. And uh, my first entry, I think I pulled, uh, I want to say 15th place with Scott's Talladega. And uh, I've heard of you course, that dog a few times. Yes, yes, sir. He's He's been a fine one for, I think, uh, Black Rock Hunting Club in Evergreen uh, as he, he passed out of my kennel. But uh, from that point forward, the disease was back on again. <laughs> I, I, I hadn't found the antibody that would, would kick it yet. <laughs> That's right. It's funny you talk about the Sherwell. Uh, doing the hunts every now and then we'll talk about it at the hunting cabin with the older guys and the generation kind of before us and they mentioned that Sherwell hunt all the time how they used to judge it and stuff it was amazing i mean and and if you ride by there today the, the old cross ties that they got off the railroad tracks to make the kennels and all are still there i really? mean 40 some years later they're still standing I, I guess they couldn't push them over when they were trimming the, the bushes but <laughs> right. it's it's a memory when i when i ride by and i see them cross ties i can still uh hear tales that ed harvey and vernell and all of them were telling and and it was just it's it's something that you can't lose right that's one of my favorite parts about getting like the chase magazine and stuff is you get to go back and they have the stories that's of right. St uh, hunts from like the thirties and forties. And it's, that's right. They just, you know, the towns used to gather back then and watch these Fox hunts. Well, back then, even, uh, you know, at times with the law and everything, it's, it's, it's tit for tat, tat. We're trying to get along. We're trying to do what's right. And we're trying to get, get, get cooperation on, on both sides. But back then the, the game ones would actually load up the judges <laughs> and their vehicle because they had the right to go across any property and take the judges to score the hounds. It was, it was really, uh, 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 I guess, I don't know how you put it, but a it was a whole different world, right? A whole <laughs> different world. It was, it was a lot of cooperation on both sides of that fence. That's 
good God, I couldn't imagine what it had been like. I wish I was old it, enough to know that. It yeah. was amazing. It was amazing. Um, you know, we kind of had a, a general idea of a topic to talk about tonight. And uh, every time I see your hounds, they're always in tip top shape. Uh, so what's kind of your, your key to success as far as keeping a, a dog healthy through their life? Well, I mean, that's something we run up against a lot. And I see a lot of posts and stuff from uh, the the different facilities that take in dogs when they've gone astray. And, you know, uh, you hear a lot about how that dog's not in good health and it was hungry and all of that. And, you know, I guess in any dog breed that happens. Uh, but if anybody had a clue what we did, to keep a running hound healthy, mm. just like any other athlete, uh, this would be a non-factor in the discussion because, uh, you know, I just, and, and this was not today's practices, you know, and prices and everything, but several years back, I just tried to keep a till on, on what I was spending in order to keep this six or eight hounds healthy because I know a lot of guys, you know, they carry 25, 30 in their kennels. I try to keep eight. Right. Eight is going to cost you at least four grand a year. Mm -hmm. and and you know if you have any kind of mishap you can double that quickly easy and uh you know food alone you know you're talking about 26 dollars a bag now for quality food at least right. uh and you're going to go through at least two bags a, a week yeah uh these dogs you know we're running in the wild we're out there. The hounds are going to do their thing. When they get done, they're going to mess around. They're going to find things they probably shouldn't find. Old carcasses and all. They're going to pick up worms. They're going to pick up parasites. Uh, you got to stay on top of that worming regiment. Right. I just wear mine today. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you don't, every 30 days, the worms will get the better hand. And, and at times just like any other uh, antibiotic or anything else, those parasites, those viruses will get the upper hand on you. Mm -hmm. You have to really stay on top of it tight. And any of those things are very expensive. I know a, a good vaccination right now is about 12 bucks yeah. for one dog. Okay. Right. You got 10, you got 20, you know, <laughs> quickly that can get into your pocket, but if you don't do it, that dog can't perform. He right. is only as good as his health will allow him to be. Exactly. You need training, you need food and you need health. Right. So. Yeah, that's, and that's a big thing, you know, as far as like people kind of misconstrue a quote unquote happy dog versus a healthy dog. You know, you see a lot of people that keep their dogs aren't even, you see Walker hounds on the inside and they're just, to be blunt, obese a lot of times. And they're like, oh, this is a happy dog. This is so much happier than your foxhound sitting outside. You know, it's 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 a hard thing to kind of tell people like, no, that your dog's actually a little one more unhealthy than what ours is. So it's it's a fine that, it's that, a fine balance. That's correct. And I, I mean you go to some of these if well, I've never been to one actually, but if you go, if you look at some of these weightlifting competitions and everything that they have in the Olympics and all those, those guys normally have one or two bottom ribs showing right. same thing with Foxhound. If he's healthy, if he's strong, and this is not a dog you've starved down to one or two ribs showing, this is a dog you've worked down to one or two ribs showing that is a strong, well-built athlete. And, uh, you know, any, any further than that, you're endangering his health. Mm -hmm by putting too much weight on him and that weight will create heat which will create overheating and heat exhaustion in that dog you got to make sure that he can take care of himself in that situation you right know? because you, go ahead i'm sorry they they want to go they don't have enough sense to quit right we have to make sure we maintain that sense and the health in order to keep him there and you I'm glad you mentioned that i was getting ready to say is that this dog food that we buy is usually a higher protein it's a very high protein, usually 27%, 24%, whatever. And a, a dog, especially a foxhound, is prone to kidney failure. I mean, that's uh, flat out honest, and foxhound has that thing. If we don't keep those dogs moving and running, that high protein is going to backfire on them very quickly. And I feel like that's a, you know, that's why we exercise also. It's a, it's finding that balance of what that dog right, likes, correct? Absolutely correct. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because uh, that I've talked to uh, 
a vet about a lot of this kidney failure because I've, I've, I've seen it many times throughout, you know, 49 years it, it, where the dog had kidney failure, well, it was in their family, whether well, it's protein, the, this and that, and all those are a factor. And a dog running himself to the point of exhaustion is, is you know, it's just like an athlete running themselves to the point of exhaustion, not getting enough liquids in them and all that. But the vet told me a lot of what we are, are looking at as far as kidney failure is not necessarily the high protein, the stuff we're putting through them in order to keep uh, worms and everything out of them, because I've heard that story too. Mm -hmm. A lot of it she believes, and this is just her opinion, but I, I, I tend to think, you know, with all of her years in school, she, she has a pretty good grasp on things, that it is also flea and tick related. Oh, okay. And she said that uh, a lot of these tick diseases that are now prevalent and, and really pushing through the canine world is causing this uh, kidney disease and everything that we're seeing a whole lot. And because I told her, I said, well, I'm using Brevecto, you know, and uh, Brevecto kills that tick and that flea once he draws off your dog. She said a lot of these new kidney diseases and everything that they're seeing come along and diseases from tick. Once he's bit, it's not that 24 hour rule that that our parents told us and our grandparents told us right. when he's bit, he now has that disease. She said, when you go to these hunts and you go into strange places that your dogs are not normally running, make sure you soak them down with a tick prevention, not just something that will kill that tick once he bites. Interesting. So that's definitely when, you know, we got these puppies, all three of yeah. us got puppies coming up and that's, that's something good to carry into raising them and putting them in these, uh, these breaking pens and getting them puppy that's hunts right. and getting going. That's right. It's a concentration right there. Right. So uh, you're getting different dogs coming in from different areas. Yeah. Make sure you do the preventive work to make sure they do not get bit. Right. You know, that kind of rolls into kind of our next little segue into this. Prepping for a hunt, you know, there's, there's three-day hunts. There's two-day derby puppy hunts. There's one days. Is there, what do you do to prep these dogs for whatever hunt that you're going to? Well, I mean, I've, I've broke a world of puppies in my day and, you know, some people say, well, you shouldn't break them before they're this age. You shouldn't break them before they're that age. A lot of them, a lot of people are six to 12 months, depending on what they're going to do with the dog. Uh, just like people. There's no perfect formula for every dog. Every dog is different. Uh, you got to watch that dog's attitude. I've always said the bigger jerk the dog is as a puppy, the more aggressive that dog is and the more ready it is. And, <laughs> Daniel, you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got two of them. <laughs> if, if they're aggressive, more than likely that aggression will lead into the field. Uh I start puppies as early as five months. I start walking them at four months. Uh, the main thing, and people say you shouldn't break them here. You shouldn't break them until they're 11 months old and their, their structure and frame and muscle mass is, is where it should be. My theory on it is you should not break a dog or put a dog in a situation he cannot succeed in. Makes a lot of sense. Oh. Uh, it doesn't matter if that dog, I've had dogs at five months old that would scream and stand on top of a track. And I've had dogs that did not break until 11 and a half, 12 months old that turned out to be fantastic animals. Uh, but I never put any puppy in any situation they cannot succeed in. Uh, beagles are fantastic for breaking a foxhound. Uh, old beagles are fantastic for breaking young beagles. You know, just make sure when they decide their day is that they want to take that front, that they have the capability to, to take that front without somebody taking it away from them. I normally break my foxhounds with rabbit dogs on rabbits. And that puppy will take two or three strides when his day gets there and he'll decide, hey, all right, now I'm in front. Do I do it or do I wait for the, the my my predecessor yeah. right my predecessor to go back by me and and try again next stride and at at 
eight, if they're running good at eight, nine months old, I will just run them with either a really, really old dog or themselves. And then at 12 months old, if, if they feel like they can get up there and they can lead, I'll put a little bit of pressure on them with some dogs that can lead and we'll make them work for it. It's, the main thing is it's a building process. If, if I see one big mistake that so many people make, it's taking a dog too far too quick. Let that dog grow in his time and you will get 100% out of that dog. If you try to push him beyond his capabilities too fast, that dog, I mean, and, and there's exceptions to the rule, but that dog will fail if he is not one of those that are just so mentally strong that he will overcome that hurdle. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And that's, that's something that we're going to have to really yeah. take note on because we're eager. <laughs> we got these right. puppies yeah, and we're, right. you know, we're chomping at the bit. To, yeah. to get these things going i mean heck they're only yours are three months old now and ours are two yeah. and we're yeah. I, we're chomping at the bit to get them in there so it's it's something that we got to find our patience with and right and learn and you you got to plan for what you're what you're uh you're going after i mean each hunt and, and you know i don't I, i've had quite a bit of success at at a pen or two and you know, I'm by far not the best, by far not the best, but my preparation for certain types of hunts has, has worked. And, you know, if, if you want to speed and drive, you got to go somewhere that speed and drives. You can't burn that dog out. You know, I've, I've done well in the Derby. I've, I've never really got into the all age too thick because what I do to a dog as far as letting them explore what they're capable of really kind of burns them out early, you know, and, and, and some guy asked me, you know, why you, why do you never place an all age? I said, because I'm done. They're done at the all age, you know, their, their best years are behind them, but they've lived happy. Right. And if you're, uh, if you're going to take them to a two day or three day hunt, you need to work that dog. You know, I was a long distance runner for Appomattox high school back in 1987, 88, and 89, <laughs> I ran the one mile. Right. In order to run the one mile, I ran at least six miles a day and most of the time eight or 10. Yeah. Same thing with that dog. You've got to prep him. You've got to give him enough rest time to recover physically. Right. But you've got to prep him hard to make sure every ounce of that one mile, he can give you, you know, 100%. He can't be burning out of steam at the end of that hunt he's okay. got to have everything he's got in order to get to from beginning to end uh, a lot of that goes back to feed making sure he's healthy worming him making sure he's got his vaccinations nothing else is dragging him down but that prep time i mean if, if you want him to run 15 hours which is three day hunt five hours a day that's 15 hours in my opinion you need to at least put 45 hours on him the previous month mm -hmm. you know yeah. Give him 10 hours a day. Right. Yeah. yeah. We got the, I know we're talking about going to the Maryland next month and I've had mine out. What we've ran what three times, three or four times in the past two weeks. Yeah. And at least six or seven hours each of those days. I know a lot of it's on the outside, but. Uh, well, I don't think that hurts you. I mean, the Maryland, I've had a lot of success at the Maryland state. It's, it's one of the, the hunts that I really look forward to every year. Uh, Billy's that place can be feast of famine. Mm. I mean, I love it. It is the ultimate goal. I mean, I love my Creed Moors. I love Java. I love Hollywood. I, I mean, it's, it's a lot of great places we can go to run around here. Tower Hill. We've got Captain Joe's John's or whatever it used is now. Uh, Turpin's Creek, Turpin's I guess. Creek, yeah. And we have some fantastic places to run, but one of the most difficult places you can run is, is Billy's. And, and you go down there one day and that thing will smoke. I, I saw the results from last week and the, the points was just unreal. Yeah. Yeah. But then the previous week, it turned into a hunting category. Right. I mean, that dog has to be so mentally tough. I mean, it's some big blocks. It's, it's some thick stuff. Can that dog hang in there when he, when the running gets up, you got to have a dog that will get to the front. I mean, he's got to get to the front. He's got to get there right now. But when it breaks down, that dog has to be able to drop his head, drop his nose, 
and not give up, not pull into the crowd that might be, all right, we're going to run around and wait for Chase to start. That dog has to drop his head and really get it done. Now, how do you go about getting your dog to that point? Is it, uh, is there, <laughs> I know those are open ended and I'm not letting, right. you don't have to share your trade secrets, but, uh, more, you know, more like, what do you look for in that dog? There you go. Uh, I, like I said, I run mine hard. Uh, as long as they want to stand up and run, I'm, I'm going to let them. I mean, they, they ain't a disappointed dog in this running time in these kennels out here behind the house. Uh, now, I, I was talking to y'all earlier, and, I, you know, y'all don't shake your heads out there because <laughs> you never know until you get inside the wire. But, you know, I'm breaking three puppies right now. All right. I, I turned all three out. I turned one old dog and their mother out, which is a very old dog. And we put them down through the woods the other day. And I, I followed them around for a while. Uh, two of them fell in there really well. They got up there and they drove in front. They got out front. Game made a left-hand turn real hard at the end of my road and came back cross. Uh, the two that I was going, wow, look at these things fly. They swung off the end to kind of sit down and put your nose down. Uh, the older dog had that race and, and took it on across the road. And uh, there was one that was standing on her heels the whole way. She didn't necessarily uh, blaze that trail on the way out, but she didn't make any mistakes either. Right. That's what I want. I don't want any mistakes. I, I'll take a dog that can average eight miles an hour perfect over a dog and that can average 12 miles an hour with mistakes every 30 seconds any day because the perfect dog is going to constantly pull to the front when that one blows off the end. I got up the next morning, uh, checked the GPS and pulled down the hall a little bit and threw my ear out the window. That puppy was still running. That was 12 hours after cast. And that's an 11 month old puppy. That's what I'm looking for. That's strong. Your heart is there. there. Your head was on right early and your heart is still in it late. Yeah. I, I ain't forced that dog to run. Right. That dog is running because it still wants to be in the game. And that's what I'm looking for. And like so, you said, you were right next to home. So that dog knows where home's at. Absolutely. That dog could come home if he's done or she's done. It can come home at any point. That's right. She so walk up the hollow. No food waiting for her right here. That's nothing but heart out there putting it out there and proving themselves. Right. That's, right. that's, that's the kind of stuff I love. You know, I got, I come from the, the deer stock world or coon right. stock, whatever you want to call them, you know, and those dogs, and you, you know, that the coon stock dogs will hunt harder than most any out dog out there. They will, they don't have the speed to carry, but them dogs will hunt. And that's something that I've always enjoyed, especially like walk, walking with my dogs. Like you said, you went out there and stayed with them a little ways. And I mm -hmm. love walking my dogs. It's something that me and my dad used to do with our dogs. And that hunt and watching them put their nose on the ground, that's the kind of stuff that I love looking for and watching for. You know, um, but it seems like a lot of outside running really brings that hunt back into them to advance themselves, especially at somewhere like Billy's. It does. And, 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 and I hate to hear sometimes that, you know, this dog will hunt, this dog won't hunt this. What opportunity have you given that dog in order to learn that trait? You know, it's, uh, it's, yes, it's bred in them. You know, we got dogs that go back to say the Helm stock and some of that. I mean, my better hunting dogs have been East coast holiday and some of those breeds, but you know, I've taken breeds that, that were considered purely speed and drive. And if you put them in a situation, it, well, you bought a dog. Right. And, and I was told it wouldn't hunt. And I told you, I said, take a dog and cast it, mm -hmm. make him do his own work because he has the hunt. And I, I'd hunted with his mama. I, I lost to his mama at the Maryland state many years <laughs> right. ago. And, and I said, I, I know she's got the hunt. You know, the dog should have the hunt in him, put him in a situation, like I said, with a puppy, don't put him in a situation he can't succeed in. And that's if, if you take 15 puppies out and dump them in a pen with an older dog, you're, you're kind of creating the perfect storm for that dog not to succeed. You took that dog, you started working him and working him a little bit more on his own and letting him have that opportunity to succeed. And you've done really, really well with that dog. Right. So that's, that's kind of the same thing. Hunt is, is 
Well, a, a friend of mine that is, has been very successful in the world of hunting and, and much more successful than me, he, he explained it. I guess it, we were sitting around six or seven years ago at a hunt. And he said, everybody asked, is it 50% the mama? Is it 50% the daddy? Is it 70% the daddy and 30% the mama? He said, I'm going to tell you straight up. It's 25% the mama, it's 25% the daddy, and it's 50% who owns that dog. Because if he doesn't do his work, the other 50 can't do theirs. That's right. So That's right. You know, you talk about the... <clears throat> You are talking about not letting that dog lose the lead earlier. I kind of had a, I feel like that was a good thing to kind of touch on. If that dog loses the lead and consistently doesn't lose the lead, is that, you think that just messes with them kind of mentally? Like this is where I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be following. Or is that like a, what's your, like, what's your kind of thought process on not letting them lose the lead to a, when they're, when they're learning and coming up? Absolutely. I mean, confidence is everything. I mean, it, we were sitting there, uh, I don't know how many years ago. I had a couple of dogs that were hitting pretty good. And and we were sitting there, and, and one of the younger guys was talking to me. And like I said, I don't consider myself an expert. I haven't had the success that many have. But, you know, as far as me just deer hunting them all the time and rolling up to a pen, I, we've done pretty decent. And... The guy asked me, said, you know, what's the difference in your dogs and my dogs? And it was, I think, 370 dogs at that hunt. And we managed to finish in the top five. I said, physically, 75% of these dogs are the same. Mentally, mine believes he's supposed to lead. Right. That's 75%. Hmm. He's, he's, my dog has never seen failure because I've never pointed him anywhere he can fail. Mentally, my dog believes he's supposed to lead that race. Now, Kenny, is he faster than all the dogs here? No, but he's not going to be satisfied until he's up there in that first one or two because I've never, never let him have that opportunity to be any less than in that first one or two. Right. So, you know, it's it's a lot of guys that bring some wonderful hounds to hunts, but have you prepared them mentally? Physically, sure, we can get them in shape. We can swim them. We can run them. We can do whatever. We can make sure they don't have worms. They don't have distemper. They don't have parvo. You know, we can do a lot of things that make that dog healthy. But if he doesn't believe in himself, you can believe in him, in him all you want, and, and it's not going to matter. Right. He's got to believe in himself. That makes a lot of sense. I know that I had one time not too long ago, that dog that I got that you were talking about mm -hmm. earlier, that dog had never liked, like you said, he was, he was kind of a, a, a mid pack dog. He, he just never seemed like he wanted to get out there and lead. And I got him out there with some of my, my, a little bit older than him, tree stock dogs. And he yanked their chain around for five hours one day when I was running on the outside. And that next hunt he went to, he finished six in that hunt. That's right. It almost like you said, it just, it built his confidence. Like, okay, I'm supposed to be here. Right. So that, that makes a lot of sense. you know what you're talking, it really but does. A buddy of mine, you know, asked me when you were getting that dog, he said, you know, what do you think about that? I said, he's the perfect owner for it mm -hmm. because he's, he's, that dog is going to run against tree stock dogs, you know, and as glorious as they are in the deer woods, I mean, it's nothing it compares to a big pack that will lock a track right they uh when you get into the field trial world that's a whole different world and there are many segues of that that you have to navigate depending on what you're you're after but uh you know the the ability to that dog to to get out there and lead consistently day after day will put it in that dog's mind that's where he's supposed to be there was never a prouder moment we were at a hunt at uh at hollywood many years ago and i had that dog phoenix and she owes, owns a java record and she broke her record the hunt before that she she was really i mean miss b was my favorite one out that that little bunch of dogs but let's face it phoenix was fast well we were sitting at the front gate and uh phoenix was on a, a red and it came by the uh 
right around what they call home plate right there where the road split up. And it was two dogs that came up the road and picked that race off in front of her. And as she crested the hill, she could see that the dogs had stole the race. She dropped the track, dropped down as tight to the ground as she could get as fast as she cut across there and did not open her mouth again until she'd passed them two dogs. I mean, she believed she was supposed to be in front and, you know, those two dogs were probably just as fast as she was, you know, but she believed she's supposed to lead. And, and, and when you can get one with the mentality that they believe they're supposed to lead, uh, you're, you're hands down ahead of the game because and like I said, Physically, most of them are the same. If you, if you do your work, they're capable of doing theirs. So and that dog just mentally knew she was supposed to be there. Right. I right. love it. I love it. Um, I want to circle around one real back to a story you had told me a while back uh, before we we end our episode. It's been a, a fun little episode. Um, you and my papa used to hunt back when you hunted together, yes. and uh, you were talking about one time where. He just kind of snuck off kind of by himself for a little while. What was the, what was the story behind that? Well, I mean, he, he always had a Jack and a Jill. And, and right. just, <laughs> if, if there was two dogs in his kennel, their names were Jack and Jill. It didn't matter if 20 years span and three generations of dogs span, there was Jack and Jill. And, <laughs> and Mr. Hudson had some fantastic dogs. And I mean, dogs that could lay down on a Fox track and, uh, you know, we all deer hunted together. It was it was a pretty good sized group back in the day, and we had a ton of land. And you know, it, pine land here, and they'd cut this one over, and it would get thick, and it would get thick with rabbits. And when it gets thick with rabbits, it would get thick with fox. It, it wasn't long. A lot of that pipeline and light line. That's where everybody would go. The Cheatham's, the Hudsons, the Scotts. We would bring some foxhounds in there and and turn them loose and we'd spend a good saturday night where everybody else was out on the town we we were saturday night on the outskirts of town uh, <laughs> that's right <laughs> listening to a fox hound. and i mean it was a lot of bragging rights there i mean oh, and yeah. and you you look at it as as just a, a evening you know out listening to some dogs but you know there were champions made out of that crowd you know they weren't just your average old you know, meat choppers that you right. would you throw a biscuit out to the back door. They, they was, these were some fine hounds. And, uh, you know, your grandfather was part of that. And when we would get off deer hunting and they would jump a fox, you know, and, and a lot of people were all, you know, back in that day was no deer. Right. I mean, you would literally sometimes, I can remember going two days and never jumping a deer. And they would, his hounds would jump a fox. Old Jack and Jill would get a fox. <laughs> One of them. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we would go on to the next cast and go on to the next cast and we'd say, where's, where's Jerry? And daddy would say, well, he's probably back there on the third hill of the pipeline. Doing what? He said, well, we're going to ride back there and say, because I'm going to cast some hounds to him. And we'd ride <laughs> back here and Jerry Hudson would be back there listening to them hounds and just a grin. I mean, just smiling. <laughs> it, it, and, you know, it's deer season. You think, all right, well, you know, you got to focus your efforts towards deer hunting, but that, that goes right back to what it's all about. Those two hounds would sit there and swing, you know, cut and swing and cut, hit that track and get it back straight and push them through the bushes. And the old fox back then, you know, would stay up. Uh, and Jerry would be just as happy as any human being could possibly be sitting there listening to them two hounds, hell with a deer hunt. He was, <laughs> he was dead set on, on seeing everything them dogs had in them to the end. Yep. And we, we, you know, end of the day, heck with the deer chase with us too, we'd ride back in. We sat with Jerry on the back of the old, uh, oh, I forget what that thing was. A little old blue pickup. That deer blazer. Had. That little and, blazer. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and, and just sit there and listen to them deer hounds long on past dark. And, uh, come on in in the evening. Mama said, what you been doing? Uh, well, we've been sitting over there with Jerry listening to a podcast. <laughs> yeah. That was, yeah, that, you know, you're talking, that was probably, before, it was definitely before my time. Right. Of, of Your daddy's kind of time. Yeah. It was yeah. more of my dad's time. And, and, you know, so it, it, 
I never got to see, you know, Papa was infamous for standing around and just, <laughs> he, you would find him at eight o'clock in the morning, he'd go pull up in a spot. And if you come back eight o'clock that evening, he ain't done nothing but get out the truck, use the bathroom. And that may, <laughs> may right. not have got out for that. <laughs> so yep. it, it's, you know, it's cool to hear those kind of stories and stuff like that. Um, he loved the Foxhound. I mean, oh, yeah. of all the people I've known, he probably loved Foxhound more than anything. I mean, deer dog and all that stuff. Yeah, that's great. But, your grandpa loved a foxhound and and he knew what one was yeah and uh, that's important because a lot of people know what a trophy is and know how to get one fast but to build a real hound is is kind of I'm, I'm seeing some of that be lost in in the modern world of of dog hunting and and i think this is fantastic what you're doing kind of hitting all subjects hitting all the bases and and saying hey you know let's make sure that we're putting our best foot forward every single day when we go into this world. Right. Right. And that's, it's something that we kind of strive for, especially, you know, you know, we, we talk about it a lot of wanting to preserve the sport as a whole, but really I know D Dylan was brought up the old school way. Like I was, and I know you were too. And Daniel, you know, you're just kind of getting into it, but you really appreciate the way that we do the way we do. And mm -hmm. it's, it's something that, I'd love to see continue go on. And that's, I think that's why we kind of, you know, we pulled you with a lot of our questions and advice because you are very honest and sincere about the way you run your dogs and treat your dogs. And, you know, it's something to really be proud of in the, in the line, the scheme of things. So, you know, we appreciate everything that you do again. And uh, we love the way you hunt and thank you. Uh, we can't thank you enough for preserving our, the, you know, what you do for preserving the sport and treating it right. Um, but I believe that's about everything. That's a pretty decent little episode right there. You know, um, thank you, Dennis, for joining us and anytime and being on here with us. Uh, this is our first guest on the show. So honors to you, sir, <laughs> for right. taking that. Uh, <laughs> Real quick before we go, we're not going to do any uh, hunts and results this week. Um, I think we're kind of discussed it, and we're, if we do a special guest, we'll we'll kind of hold off on the hunts and results and maybe double up on them next week if people want to hear them. So uh, just a real quick, um, if you're a Virginia native, make sure you're all on Virginia Hunting Dog Alliance, uh, vahda.org. Uh, get on there. They help fight for everything that we support and we love. I think North Carolina's put one together too, because I know they're going through some struggles. So uh, I don't know what the name of it is, but if you're in North Carolina or you hunt North Carolina, please take a look around and see what you can find in order to help support these guys. The pins and everything down there are, are looking at some legislative action that uh, may, may affect the way you are able to uh, navigate hunts and stuff down there. So please get involved in that. Correct. And, and also, um, I know Bill and Lisa Howell down there that run uh, Flower Hill, they're a big part of, it, it may be the same, you're, same thing you're talking about, the North Carolina Wildlife Pen Association. Yes. Uh, yes. The NCWPA, excuse me. Um, and they are all, always looking for, the, you know, there's a big thing on Facebook about it's pen owners that donate and become members, but anybody can donate. We uh, have kind of slacked up and we're supposed to be sending the donation down our own selves. So, we're going to try to get that down there as soon as possible from the Houndstail podcast. So, um, but like you said, if, if you're in North Carolina, absolutely anything you can do to help and keep the sport alive. And Hey, I, James has not ever brought this up. I, I've listened to all of his podcasts and tried to help in all of them, but listen, guys, sponsors go a long way. If any of these guys, any of you out there that's, that sell hunting dog supplies, whether it be beagle, bird dog, foxhounds, coon dogs whatever please get in, in contact with james and try to be part of this program and help it move forward because this is where our future's at guys i mean this is young man right here his buddies and everything trying to get things moving in the right direction for us so if you want to be part of it please be part of it absolutely we definitely appreciate that um but definitely hit us up if you got any kind of questions or if you want to talk about some, you know, talk about some stuff like that. Houndstailspodcast at gmail.com. The tales is T A L E S. Uh, we'll be, we'd love to hear from you. Love to talk to you. Maybe, you know, maybe we can work something out. Um, sent, uh, almost French Virginia people. Y'all check out Chestnut Mountain Feed. 
uh, good friends of all of us. Uh, they have always taken care of us very good, very well. Um, you can check them out on Facebook, Google them. Uh, it's always there for us and supply anything that we need. Um, and last but not least, um, if you're going to keep following us, follow us on Spotify, Pocket Cast, Google Podcasts, Radio Public, and on Breaker. And you can also look, listen to us here on Anchor. Um, and again, shout out to you, Dennis. Um, your music career is still steady going. Uh, good luck to you and everything with that. Thank you. And uh, I believe that's everything, guys. Um, so shout out to everybody for listening. It's been awesome. We've had this last episode had, I think, almost 100 views in less than 24 hours. So that was kind of a kind of a big deal for us. So it's, it's steadily climbing. Steady so. going. I love it. I love it. So thank you all for listening. Uh, again, James Hudson, Dylan Watson, Daniel Evans, and uh, our special guest, Dennis Scott. And uh, happy hunting, everybody. Y'all take care. <laughs>